Hello, my name is Charlotte Philipson, reporting for On The Track. Even in the 21st century, there are strange and unexplored places, and in these unexplored places, there look strange and often horrifying creatures. Creatures from the darkest depths of a man's imagination. This episode, we follow Carl Marshall into an overgrown forest in North Devon in search of something that a sane god would never allow. Well, I always admitted that the CFZ grounds needed a bit of refurbishment. My name's John Downs and welcome to another episode of On The Track. This has always been my favourite time of the year, but autumn being the end of summer and the transition period before winter comes around has always been tinged with sadness for me. And this year something different has happened. As readers of the blog will know, Karina is not well at the moment. And so, on the track, Animals and Men, Gonzo Weekly and all the other things that we do will continue to happen. But, at least for the time being, we're not going to make any promises as to the time scale of their releases. I am sure you will all send your prayers and good wishes to us, and hope that the time won't be long when we no longer have to say, in the words of the old BBC information adverts, normal service will be resumed as soon as possible. Something really weird's happened at Loch Ness, Charlotte. And I'm sure you'll like this story. Not only is there something weird at Loch Ness, but it's for a girl from Charlotte. But two people have both taken pictures of what has been claimed as the Loch Ness Monster a few hours apart on the same day. And I don't think that's ever happened before. So first of all, this one was taken by a Canadian tourist on a camera phone. What do you think it looks like? Looks like a turtle. I can see that. You can even see what. I don't know if this is just um, an optical illusion because you've put the idea of a turtle into my mind, but that could even be seen to be in its shell. But the weird thing is that people have said this is the best, these are the best two Loch Ness monster photographs years and years and years but if these were photographs of anything else they'd just be being seen as weird blobs in the water now if you look this is a close-up of it i can't see if is that darker does that look like there's something else underneath yeah, the water or? it does but it's hard to see and this one was taken by charlotte robinson age 12 on her iPhone um, a few hours later it looks to me like the same object yeah, and now over to Gary Campbell from the official Loch Ness Monster fan club I've never actually known why it's official what officials have authorised it or on whose responsibility he is the official Loch Ness Monster fan club but he is a mover and shaker in Nessie circles and he had this to say And then in today's Daily Star, which as we both know, they're nice people, but it's not exactly the last bastion of great journalism, there was a story saying that the giant sea monster carcass has washed up on beach, stunning divers. Well, it'd be really exciting if it 
was a giant sea monster carcass, but what's that? Squid. It's not just a squid, it's a dead squid. And it's a dead squid that's only 14 feet long. So, apart from the fact it's quite an impressive thing to find on a beach when you're out walking your dog, it's nothing really newsworthy. It's not a new species, it's not anything that's too big to be a known species, it's just a dead squid. But what I did think was funny this morning, when I put this up on the news, on the CFZ blog, look what happened! I got a picture, I put a freeze frame and come up for some reason it came up with a picture of Donald Trump saying that he feels sad for somebody or other, I can't remember. But it says giant monster and then it has a picture of the American president. I think that is what they call serendipity. You know the thing that I find most disturbing about all this is the way that things which are perfectly normal like that squid being washed up in New Zealand, are being touted by the press all around the world as if they are something magical and something extraordinary. And it's not just that the human race, at least in the Western world, seems to be getting more and more divorced from the reality of the natural world, but en masse, as a society, we're getting more and more superstitious. Last year, two performance artists that I revere a lot put on a three-day event in Liverpool called Welcome to the Dark Ages. Well, I think that the Dark Ages, as ushered in by this new journalistic habit of fueling people's superstition and nonsense. I think those dark ages were well on their way to arriving. A few months ago, it was my 16th birthday, and we went to Exmoor Zoo for the day. Now, because the Beast of Exmoor is such an important North Devon cultural icon, we have got two Black Panthers and other exhibits on the subject. For those of you not aware, Exmoor is an area of wild country on the borders of North Devon and North Somerset. And it's an area of rich natural heritage and often bloodthirsty history. In 1869, Richard Blackmore published a book called Lorna Doon. It told the story of the romance between Jan Ridd, a young farmer's son in North Devon, and Lorna, the daughter of a family of wild outlaws of the Dunes who lived in one of the wild and more remote parts of Exmoor. And for the last 150 years the book has been a very popular one all over the world and is quite probably responsible for a large number of the tourists from all over the globe who come to Exmoor each year. But for nearly half a century, there have been reports of a giant black cat-like creature reported from wilder parts of Exmoor. And over the years, it has been given the name of the Beast of Exmoor. And as Charlotte says, it has become an undoubted cultural icon in the region. When I saw the panther, I was shocked by how magnificent and powerful this animal was and I was glad that I was on the other side of the fence. But the possibility of one of these animals roaming free just a few miles away from where I live is an exciting one. The animals that are known as black panthers are either the black colour morph of the leopard or of the jaguar, in this case of the leopard, which is of course an extremely successful predator found over wide swathes of the globe from northern China to the southernmost tip of Africa, through deserts, forests, mountains and savannah. And could they survive comfortably on Exmoor? Yes, I don't think there's any doubt of that. 
It's important not to see the phenomenon of the boost of Exmoor in isolation. What appear to be mystery cats have been reported in every county in the British Isles, from the outskirts of London to the furthest parts of northern Scotland. Mystery cats have not been reported just from Britain. We have reports from various countries in Western Europe, from Australia and in New Zealand, all places where there are no known species of big cat of any colour. And something else that really needs to be taken into consideration is that big cats of several different species are such an important cultural image that it's actually not surprising that if somebody is driving across a wild part of England and has a glimpse of an animal out of the corner of his eye that his brain fills in the gaps and interprets what he has seen as a big cat. But at the Centre for Fortune and Zoology we have been studying the mystery big cats of the west of England for over 20 years and in 2010 we had a breakthrough. Yeah, hello everybody. Um, yes, we went up with uh, Jonathan and uh, we've also been up to the forest with Andrew Perry and uh, his friends and collected various uh, hair samples. I've been doing some analysis, you've heard some of it already the first evening, badgers and uh, women's hair and dog hair and water bowls and various bits and bobs and pieces. So, but this morning uh, I started analyzing some other samples, uh, some of them found by me and some of them found by uh, Andrew Perry and uh, his friends and uh, lo and behold, could we have an, uh, one of these uh, pictures of the hairs, please? Uh, well, <laughs> this is, is this is uh, the main sewer pipe outside of Wolseri. <laughs> uh, no, when I went to uh, uh, went through some of these hairs, um, it turned out that first of all uh, they were cat hairs, and when I started looking a little bit closer, it turned out that they weren't only cat hairs; they were actually hairs from a big cat. Uh, I did find a few of those a bit earlier on the day, but they were in a rather poor condition, so it wasn't possible to say anything about what species they were. But these, you won't be able to see any details because of this, of, because of this, uh, the lighting and so on. But this is the hairs of a leopard, and it's not possibly the hairs of a leopard. It may be the hairs of a leopard. It is definitely the hairs of a leopard. Uh, there's various things you can see. I'm, I'm going to go tomorrow. I'm going to bore everybody to tears with the, the details of how you analyze hair. But what you look at is basically where the colored parts are, the structure of the color in the center of the hair, and various other other identification marks. Let's try for one of the other pictures. They might be a little bit easier to see. Might. Okay. Here you can actually see one of the uh, identification marks uh, for a cat. You can see the center of the hair is all one dark blob of color. That's where you find all the color uh, in the hair. And there's a light zone outside of it. A hair is more or less uh, built like a tree trunk with a bark and, and a trunk, if you like. The trunk is where all the color is and the light uh, zone is where that's the bark. And the borderline between the bark and the colored zone is very rough and uneven. You can see little notches and things sticking out, especially on the top side. It looks in, in part like the uh, blade of a hacksaw. That's a uh, typical, uh, that's characteristic of a cat. So there's no doubt, no doubt about this being a cat. And uh, there's various other diagnostic features. I won't go through all of them because then everybody will fall off their seats with boredom. But this is the hair of a leopard. And uh, altogether we have some, this morning I told Jonathan we had some 8 or 10 leopard hairs, but I've been going through all of it now and we have some 30 hairs from a leopard. So there's even, should anybody want to verify this, there's lots of hair for them to uh, go on. and. If they will leave the hairs alone, there will also probably be enough material to make a DNA, a DNA 
analysis to make, well, just to put the final nail in, uh, uh, in it. But as for me, there's no doubt about it. This is the hairs of a leopard, which also means that at least one leopard has been walking around the woods up here uh, and judging from the state of the hairs within the last couple of weeks. Further analysis of the hairs took place at the University of Durham and Copenhagen University, where two separate scientists analysed the DNA, and yes, they did prove to be from a leopard and furthermore, one from a sub-Saharan African subspecies. Which means that the animal could not be a British native and therefore had to be introduced, but it is still massively exciting. Knowing all this made my birthday visit to Exmoor Zoo even more exciting and I'm looking forward to continuing the hunt for the British Big Cat. Back when I was a little boy, one of my favourite things was when my parents would show what they called pictures on the wall. They'd get out a slide projector and show the family photographs that they'd taken back when they were colonial service officers in Nigeria. Now, as the director of the Centre for Fortune Zoology, some half a century later, one of my favourite times of the year is when Richard comes back from an expedition and shows his slideshow explaining their adventures. And so, here, just for a change, is Richard's pictures on the wall from the expedition to Tajikistan. This is Raga Bali, one of our witnesses. He saw the ghoul attacking a tethered donkey and he's also seen Caspian tigers. Raga Bali talking to our interpreter, Romit Valley. Romit Valley, an area where another witness was attacked by a ghoul in the early 80s. This is another eyewitness, the man who was attacked by a female ghoul in the early 1980s. Another view of the area of the attack. An abandoned shepherd's hut that a number of years ago when it was still occupied ghouls were supposed to hurl down rocks at it in the evening. The bloke on the top is just some random stranger. Uh, one of the rivers along the Romit Valley. One of our camping areas. Another eyewitness. I see he's got a... Is, are they Muslim or not? They are mostly Muslim, yes. Dave with a solifugid. They are totally harmless, aren't they? They can give you a fair nip, but they're not poisonous. Um, villagers in the Romit Valley. And where are the villagers friendly? Very. Very nice house we stopped in and the upper fork of the Romit Valley. Veranda on said house. The shell of a horse field's tortoise. Uh, mountains of the Romit Valley. Romit Valley GV. Beekeeper who had seen the tiger and whose father had seen the gull. Red back spider caught by Dave. Do, do, do they poison us? Yes. That's me near a waterfall at the head of the upper upper fork of the Romit Valley. And looking looking <coughs> infected. Dave. That's an eyewitness who saw and was pursued by a pair of ghoul in a uh, mill. Yeah, he was uh, working in a, a mill that was operated by a water wheel and then the water flow stopped. He went to investigate and upstream he found two. Um, Gaul, a male and a female, in the water, blocking the water. And when they saw him, they chased him back to the mill and banged, when he locked the door, banged on the door and jumped on the ceiling and banged the ceiling for about an hour. And finally, this is the old mosque in Dushanbe, the capital city of Tajikistan. And it reminded me of something which happened 50 years ago. Well, 49 actually, if you want to be exact. My family were on our way home to England from Hong Kong for my father's annual leave and something nasty happened to the aircraft and we had to make a special unscheduled landing in Tehran, which then as now is the capital of Iran. In those days Iran was neither a theocracy or a republic and was still under the rule of the Shah. And I remember very little about our unscheduled stopover, which was only for a night and part of the next day. But I remember being woken at dawn by the cries of the muezzin, calling the faithful to prayer. 
and I tiptoed out of bed and looked out over the balcony and I saw a lot of flat blue houses covered in tiles like these. And this picture of Richard's has brought back a very sweet memory of my youth. But enough of this, it's time to go over to an idea of Charlotte's. This new segment was Charlotte's idea, as was the title, with people in the CFZ spread far and wide across the globe and of all ages from their teens to their 80s. Everyone has a different opinion of their favourite Mr Animals. And so now, each episode, we are asking a different crypto authority for their favourites. And as Charlotte said, it's time for the Crypto's Cryptids. And this month, we have Carl Marshall in the hot seat. Okay, in uh, 2013, I uh, went on an expedition to North Borneo. And whilst there, I was given a first-hand account of quite an interesting cryptid, which I don't think has really been publicised anywhere. Um, it's called the Glowing Bird of Borneo. Um, deep in the forest of Ulukamanis in Sabah, which is in North Borneo. And there are reports of glowing birds, which... Uh, seem to be found usually in forest clearings, in the deep forests. Um, my guide has also seen these birds and uh, I asked him what he thought they, what they might be and he was quite open to the idea that they were probably some species of paradise bird endemic to Borneo. Obviously in terms of um, where the islands are located, uh, Borneo is only really a geographic stone throw from uh, Papua New Guinea, so the idea of an endemic species of Bornean paradise bird is not unreasonable. Um, I thought this was quite interesting, uh, so that would be one of my one of my uh, one of my favourite cryptids. Now, boys, now and, girls, boys and girls, what do we have here? And now it's time for a brand new feature for the show. It's time for on the track product placement. There are all sorts of people who are friends and relations of the CFZ and people who are members of the CFZ themselves who do all sorts of peculiar things. And now, each episode, we're going to give a brief roundup of some of these aforementioned things. It's nice to know that in an ever-changing world, some things do remain constants. Like our politicians, the vast majority of the politicians in the Western world are venal buffoons, self-serving idiots, only in it put their snouts in the trough. Like the British obsession with the weather, last summer we had glorious sunny weather and the papers were full of complaints about the number of people who were going to get heat stroke. And already the papers are full of stories claiming it's going to be the coldest winter in living memory, just like they do every year. And you know what else always happens? Nobody ever buys John Downs' records. So it was, so it always will be. And the I, John Downs, have just made another record for the first time in five years. I've been making albums since 1981, and the one thing that they've all got in common is that no one really bought any of them. And the reason why? It's because I've never bothered to publicise them. I don't make music for money, and I always find the publicity game a rather vulgar waste of time. But this time I'm going to do my best to do it differently, which is why I'm here in my garden, in my wheelchair, with two people wearing animal masks and brandishing axes, and a load of smoke bombs being let off. It's what pop stars do, isn't it? Okay, yes, I know that I'm too old, too fat, and too crippled to appear on top of the pops, and yes, top of the pops doesn't actually exist anymore. But I have a record I and for once I'm going to do my best to see if I can tell more people about it. It's got 11 songs on it and it's taken me for the last 3 or 4 years to record and I think it's rather good, but I would say that, wouldn't I?
Mr. Kurira for a monthly visit to the Watcher of the Skies. I have always felt a curious affinity with this species of bird, probably because for 30 years I was a secretary, and this is a secretary bird, a highly specialised ground-dwelling bird of prey from an older family than the other Old World raptors. It is native to sub-Saharan Africa and is sadly non-migratory, so will never be a natural visitor to these shores. But I think you'd be surprised quite how many completely unexpected avian visitors Britain does have, and that's what this segment from the track is all about. Bernard Hoivermans himself said that cryptozoology wasn't the study of monsters, but the study of unexpected animals, and in the UK what could be more unexpected than vultures, spoonbills and albatrosses? Yes, even the kings of the Southern Ocean have been seen in British waters. Two species of albatross have been recorded in the UK in recent years. Not all of our feathered visitors are quite so spectacular, but nearly every day there is something exciting to greet the watcher of the sky. Further north due to climate change. Estimates 
suggests there are now around 2,000 pairs of hobby falcons across the UK, with the majority in southern England. And back we go to Norfolk, it's time to report that Ayrshire Wetland Centre has reared 100 grey partridge as part of its conversation, conversation, conservation work and plans to release most of them at Dickenburg Moor, where they are creating new nature as well. Grey partridges, also known as the English, England, English partridge, were once a common sight both nationally and in the north of countryside before a steep decline put them on the red list. In Edwardian times there were more than a million roaming the British countryside. By the early 1990s this had dropped to 145,000 and today estimates suggest that this figure has halved again. Many factors are thought to have contributed to the birds' decline, including pesticides, the loss of suitable grassland for nesting, and a rise in predators such as foxes, rats, magpies, crows, and public humans. Norfolk is home to about 10% of the remaining national grey partridge, thanks in part to conservation efforts by shooting estates for all people. West Swindon has had a rare feathered visitor in the shape of a poo-poo. Yes, Charlotte? <laughs> this bird is normally found in Africa or Southern Europe and is about the size of a magpie. While it is uncommon to find poo-poos in the UK, they sometimes get blown off course as they migrate from Africa to Europe. Pete Brash, an ecologist at Swindon-based charity, the National Trust, suggests that the mystery bird could be a youngster that left southern Europe for Africa but flew the wrong way. He added that hoopoos don't breed in Britain but do get seen in spring and autumn migrations. Spring birds have usually overshot their normal continental breeding grounds, and the autumn bird is most likely a youngster that's headed out in the wrong direction. in the cheap seat, thank you. Oh and that is it for this episode. Now over to Jonathan for the usual look at new, uh, no, red, no, what's it called? Oh, it's no, and rediscover species. And thank you to my assistant, Lily Tinkerbell, who was sitting with me. A new species of the rather near decorator group of colobrid snakes has been described based on two specimens from the Sierra Madre Dulcera, Guerra in Mexico. The new species differs from all other members of the genus Radnea by a number of characteristics including scale, patination and colour. The specific name, Neutralis, comes from the Latin neutra, meaning nape. It makes reference to the large neutral blotches present in the new species. Two new species of geckos of the genus Canonatatis have been described from the southern western ghats of Kerala. Both species are medium to large size and can be differentiated from all other Indian congeners by a suite of distinct morphological characters. Both species are found in the high elevation forests of the two major massifs, Anamayai Hills and Agasamalai Hills, and are presently known to have very restricted distributional ranges. The discovery of these novel species highlights the understudied diversity of reptiles in the high mountain ranges of the Western Ghats in India. Trichomyceteris rosa blanca is described as a new troglobitic catfish species from caves in southwest Santander in Colombia. These caves are drained by the Canary River of the Magdalena River Basin. The new species is characterized by the advanced condition in the typical troglomorphisms found in other congeneric cave dwelling species such as absence of eyes and pigmentation. 
Barbus anatolicus is a new species of barbel and has been described from the Kizilurimak and the Yesilurimak river drainages in the southern Black Sea Basin. It is distinguished from other barbus species in the Middle East by a unique scalation coloration as well as by DNA analysis. The name of the species is derived from the Anatolia region of Turkey, in which it has been recorded. A new troglobitic species of pseudoscorpion of the genus Antilobisum is described from Sancti Spiritus province in Cuba. Antilobisum tomasi is the third known species of the genus and is well characterized by its large size and extremely slender appendages. Biogeographical and ecological considerations on the genus are given. A new investigation of 1,084 BP sequences of the cytochrome B gene has been used to assess the taxonomic status of small blind moles from eastern Thrace in Bulgaria and European Turkey. A new species, Talpa multinorum, has been described. The new species differs from Talpa europea, another mole occupying Thrace by having a sealed palpebral fissure and a first upper molar with no parastyle and by it being far smaller. The contemporary distribution range of T. martinorum is small and restricted to the Black Sea coast between Burgas in Bulgaria and Istanbul in Turkey. The species name is an eponym to the married couple Vladimir and Evigenia Martino, two early students of Balkan mammals. I would like to also point out that whereas every effort has been made to contact the copyright holders of these photographs, we believe that we are justified in reproducing them in this not-for-profit video using the policy of fair use. However, if there is anybody who believes that their intellectual or legal rights have been infringed, please contact us and we will do our best to bring the matter to a mutually acceptable solution. The name's Blake, Max Blake. He has a license to, well I'm actually not quite sure what he has a license to do, but Max is in Russia. And then there's this. Back when we restarted this show over a year ago, I asked my friend Louis from Sussex if he could set up a Patreon campaign. Patreon is one of the new generation of crowdfunding initiatives and I thought then, and I still think now, that Patreon is one of the best ways that we'll be able to fund both the Centre for Fortune Zoology and this show. Louis did as I asked and was as good as his word and we have a Patreon page and if you'd like to support us please check out this URL and see what you can do. Thank you. Thank you for watching this Moz episode and we hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to click that like button to subscribe as well as clicking the bell so you get notified whenever we upload a new video. And please share this video on social media and check out our Facebook page. Thank you and goodbye! There was a saying in the Old West that no matter what happened, the Pony Express would always get through. It might not get there on time, but it would always get through. And I like to think that it's the same with the Centre for Fortune Zoology. As I explained at the beginning of the show, we're in the middle of a family crisis at the moment. And so, this episode of On the Track is a week late. But when it comes down to it, it doesn't matter. We've all pulled together and we're dealing not just with the family crisis, but we put out another episode, which I'm very proud of, of this little show. I'd like to say a big thank you to everybody who has helped. And I'd also like to say a big thank you to all the people who each month support the CFZ in our activities around the world. And I'd just like to say thank you to you all. Without you, none of this would be possible. Next month we've got all sorts of exciting things planned. But you're going to have to wait till then to find out what they are. So, until then, be seeing you.